Hello and welcome to the episode 240 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today we will focus on the continuation of the work on the BBC's Mercy Beat documentary, the first meeting with Bob Dylan and the start of the work on Dear Prudence. On the 28th of August 1960, the Beatles, in their quintet lineup with Pete Best on drums and Stu Sutcliffe on bass, performed at the Indra Club in Hamburg, West Germany. With this four and a half hours engagement, their first residence in town reached 12 evenings, a quarter of its length. Let's move on with two engagements at the Cavern Club. The first was on this date in 1961. The Beatles, now a quartet with Pete Best still on drums and Paul McCartney on bass, performed a lunchtime concert at the Matthew Street venue in Liverpool. Exactly one year later, in 1962, the final lineup of the band, featuring Ringo Starr on drums, performed at the Cavern for a rare evening dance event on a Tuesday night, so that they could fulfill an engagement in Morecambe on the 29th of August. For the occasion, the Beatles were second in the bill, following the Blue Jeans and followed by Jerry Levine and the Avengers. In 1963, starting again at 9.30 am, the Beatles took part to the second straight day of filming for the BBC's Mercy Beat Boom documentary directed by Don Howard. Today, the band was in the BBC's Dickinson Road premises in Manchester, filmed in a dressing room while discussing their past and their plans and hopes for the future. The lads appeared while applying theatre makeup in preparation for a concert, which would be distilled from the performances filmed yesterday, and walking around backstage with their instruments as if they were to appear live on BBC. At night, the lads performed the third of six consecutive engagements at the Audion Cinema in Southport. 1964, for the continuation of their first North American tour, the Beatles performed one show at the Forest Hill Tennis Stadium in Forest Hills, New York, in front of a full house with 16,000 people. Before the actual gig, the band witnessed more scenes of Beatlemania, with about 2,000 fans waiting at the Kennedy Airport at their arrival at 2.55 am, a fan stealing and then returning a medallion off Ringo Starr as they arrived at their hotel, and a wake-up with a thousand more people outside, despite the fact that the police had dispersed all the early hopeful by 4 am. The important event of the day was a fateful meeting between the Fabs and Bob Dylan, happened at their hotel after the Forest Hills concert, and facilitated by the mutual acquaintance of writer Al Aronowitz, also present. Dylan, his road manager Victor Maimundes and Aronowitz, were prevented by the police from entering the Delmonico Hotel elevator until Beatles' Roddy Mal Evans came down from the suit's floor to pick them up. The trio was introduced to the Beatles and their manager Brian Epstein, and offered champagne, French wines or scotch and coke. The Fabs, always good hosts, offered Dylan Purple Hearts, the street name for Dexamil, a kind of amphetamine available over the counter in UK and wildly abused in the early 60s by the younger generation for its antidepressant and anxiolytic effects. But Dylan declined, saying that he preferred to smoke marijuana, thinking that the Beatles were already users of the drug. It wasn't so. After everyone had agreed to give pot a try, Dylan proceeded preparing the joints and, to avoid to be seen by either the room service personnel or the police stationed outside the rooms, the party moved to one of the bedrooms. While George Harrison maintains that they had already tried the drug in 1960 without liking it, this time it was different. Perhaps it was the wine, perhaps the company, but everyone spent a few hours in merriment, finding the experience liberating. Paul declared that it was the first time he was thinking clearly, while Brian Epstein seemed to face his own inner demons, looking at himself in the mirror and shouting, Jew! Jew! pointing at himself, 
as if he was taking off his shoulders some kind of weight. Evidently, racism cut differently in the Britain's entertainment establishment than it did elsewhere. During the evening, Dylan and Lennon also managed to talk about songwriting, confronting their different points of view. For Dylan, it was all about the lyrics, with the music coming second, as a mere accompaniment. John naturally disagreed. As quoted in the anthology book, Forget the lyrics. You know, we're all out of our minds. Are we supposed to be listening to lyrics? No, we're just listening to the rhythm and how it does it. Naturally, the differences were already disappearing. The Beatles, and John Lennon in particular, had been inspired by Dylan's output to try and write something a bit more personal and meaningful. Dylan, on the other hand, had been inspired by the Beatles to pick up electric instruments and explore territories normally off for folk artists. Further developments most definitely followed in the not-so-distant future. The press and everyone following the Beatles on tour were naturally forbidden entrance in the suits for the night. From the following day, nobody of the ten people present ever mentioned the cannabis intake to anyone until well after the end of the tour. The Beatles decided that the experience had been extremely positive. They woke up feeling different and were pleasantly surprised by the lack of any side effect to the drug. Me talking about it in these terms, naturally, doesn't mean that I condone any illicit drug taking. You should think carefully about modeling your life after a 50-year-old experience. The world has changed. If you have extra money to spend on a thrill, how about a donation to support this channel and our growing community? It's thanks to your help that I can keep on producing the best music-related content I can, and while it is definitely not the same high as any drug can give you, if you've been listening this far, you must like it. Visit www.simonmas.com support, think about it, and make the difference. Thank you! On the 28th of August 1965, the Beatles resumed their touring duties after a five-day break, traveling on the Californian seaside on a hired coach to play the Balbo Stadium in San Diego, California. Before the concert, chosen over an alternative engagement in Salt Lake City, they received the key of the city by the hands of four female fans. The event was not sold out, and the Beatles only earned an extra $135.17 on top of their guaranteed $50,000, a grand total of $411,922.76 in 2020 money. I wonder if they felt tricked. Another live in the US in 1966 with the Beatles playing one show at the Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, California, in front of 45,000 fans. The planned departure in an armored truck was thwarted by the closure of the main gate of the stadium, where the truck was supposed to pass to gain the exit. It took more than two hours before an alternative route was opened and the truck could make its way through the hordes of screaming fans, during which the band had to wait inside the dressing room completely isolated, with nothing to do. Meanwhile, outside, the battle was raging. The fans and the police clashed, people were hurt, and chaos reigned for hours after the Beatles left. In 1968, the Beatles, minus Ringo Starr, still away after his decision to leave the band, were back to Trident Studios in London. Between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m., they started recording Dear Prudence, using the Trident's 8-track recorder to put the song together piece by piece, with each track recorded separately, until the desired result was achieved. For the basic track, completed in this session, George Harrison and John Lennon played guitar, while Paul McCartney was on drums. The session cost DMI £431, about £7,500 in 2020 money. 
the label paid, but one can understand why EMI much prefer the Beatles to have these long sessions at its own studio, where studio time and personnel was just an administrative cost, almost negligible. Let's close the episode with three events happened in 1969. In the morning, Apple Records threw a party to celebrate the release of the debut single of the Radna Krishna Temple, Hare Krishna Mantra, produced by George Harrison. George was naturally present, along with several members of the London Hare Krishna movement, and lots of journalists and photographers. The party was held at The Wood, a large house in the south of London. The guests were served vegetarian food and non-alcoholic drinks. In the afternoon, George and his wife Patty travelled to the Isle of Wight to attend the festival. John, Ringo and their partners would arrive in a couple of days, but Paul decided to remain in London. His first child, Mary, was born on this very date, and, understandably, he had other things on his mind than seeing the first Dylan public appearance in three years. This is it for today. Tomorrow we'll talk about the last live performance of the Beatles, among other things. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.